It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. First, I'd like to wish everybody a happy International Day of Francophonie likes to say the integrity commissioner cleared him 1,000% over his green belt grab. But you know what the premier won't say? Whether or not he told the commissioner that developers were charged admission to the stag and doe. Speaker, the commissioner has said that his clearance at the time was, and I want to quote him, only as good as the information provided to me by the member or their staff. So, Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Did he disclose all of the details about these events to the Integrity Commissioner? To reply on behalf of the government. The government. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, look, uh, the Premier has uh, been working, uh, obviously, with, uh, with the Commissioner on this, and the Commissioner uh, will continue uh, his, uh, uh, his review of that, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, of course, we are going to continue to focus on the things that, uh, that Ontarians have asked us to focus on, and that includes, of course, ensuring that uh, uh, we build more homes across the province of Ontario, ensuring that we continue to make important investments like the investment that we saw with Volkswagen. And I want to take this moment just to... Just to congratulate uh, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, and the Premier, who uh, have brought yet another important investment to the province of Ontario, which will see thousands of jobs coming to the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This is a province that is moving in the right direction, Speaker. We are one of the leading jurisdictions when it comes to the automotive manufacturing of tomorrow, when it comes to batteries, Bots. and it is a whole-of-government approach, which includes the Minister of Mines, which includes the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Finance Minister, the Labour Minister. Minister, the Education Minister, the Solicitor General, all of government working to bring jobs. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I don't know, maybe the House Leader didn't hear my question because I was asking about the Ford family stag and doe and the Integrity Commissioner's investigation. And, and by the way, uh, Speaker, there's so much evidence actually mounting that the Integrity Commissioner told us he can't get to it all at once because he's so busy summoning witnesses. Expert after expert has proven Order. that we have more than enough land to build affordable homes for people without paving over the green belt for overpriced luxury mansions. But this government Order. doesn't like experts when they get in the way. Last week, we learned that this government quietly muzzled the green belt council so they couldn't speak out against the premier's land grab. So my next question to the Premier is, was, what was his government so question. afraid the Council would say? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, we appreciate the, uh, the work of all of our, uh, our members on uh, all of our committees that uh, affect the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, all of the stakeholders, uh, including those members of the Greenbelt Council. Uh, for months, I, uh, I attended those meetings, and I work collaboratively with uh, with the council, and uh, will continue to do so as we move forward. But again, the, the leader of the opposition is fundamentally not talking about the problem in this province. This the problem in our province is there's not enough homes to meet people's needs. There are a generation of sons, daughters sons, granddaughters that have no path to home ownership. New Democrats will always stand against that. This government will continue to put plans, bills, regulations in place that get shovels in the ground. That's our commitment to the next here, generation. Here. And the final supplementary. Five years later, and life is less affordable in this province under this government's watch. Speaker, in 2018, this Premier promised Ontario that he would never touch the Green Belt. He swore up and down that he would protect it. Conservative promise made, Conservative promise broken. Now we risk losing vital farmland, a massive carbon sink, and a key protection against flooding, all so that a few well-connected insiders Order. can make a profit. Concerned Ontarians, including those of us in the official opposition, have called on the federal government to intervene. So my question is to the Premier, will his government do the right thing and stop this unnecessary greenbelt grab, or do we need to wait for the feds to protect the land that he won't? Government House Leader. This uh, must be the same federal government that promised in 2015 that they would 
stop the Pickering Airport and return that back to farmers, and we still haven't seen that promise made and that promise uh, kept by the federal government. This is the same, of course, Liberals and NDP coalition that ripped thousands of acres away from, the, from farmers in the Rouge National Urban Park, Mr. Speaker. Now, when we were bringing the Rouge National Urban Park federally, they wanted to take farmers off the land, kick them off, and they wanted to reforest that entire area. In fact, Order. the previous Liberal government evicted a generational farmer so that they could create a park that 15 years later only recently opened, Mr. Speaker. That is the record Order. of the opposition. We are going to continue to ensure that the people of the province of Ontario have access to homes, Mr. Speaker. Generations have come to this Box. province with the dream of home ownership, and because of the work that we're doing, thousands, millions more are coming because they know they have the hope of a job, and Mr. Speaker, with us, they're going to have their first home. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, if you want to talk about housing, let's talk about how well this government's plan on housing has been going. It is harder than ever to find an affordable place to live in this province, and homelessness is at a record high. In Toronto, on average, three unhoused people died every week last year. Three a week, that's 187 lives lost because this government didn't have the, the plan in place to ensure they had a safe and stable place to live. Speaker, if you're homeless in Toronto, your life expectancy is now half that of a housed person. That is not normal. Speaker, my question is to the Premier, will he bring back real rent control and invest urgently in the supportive housing we need to help prevent even one more life from being lost? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. There, there's a lot to unpack there, Speaker. Oh, yeah. and, and, is and, there ever? You know, I want to remind Ontarians. I want to remind Ontarians that every single time this government has brought forward progressive housing policy, one thing has happened. New Democrats have voted against it. Every single time. You know, even, even the Ontario big city mayors have joined us in asking the federal government to pay our fair share. There's, there's one party, one party that won't join our government in support of that, and that's New Democrats. In fact, Speaker, in fact, Speaker let's, let's lay it on the table. You know, New Democrats want to tax affordable and non-profit housing. That's what they continue to stand up for. Order. On this side of the House and, and Order. our members in front of me, our government will continue, continue to believe Spons. that non-profit and affordable housing. There was an unparliamentary remark. Speaker. I don't know who said it. If it happens again, better not. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, New Democrats will always stand up for truly affordable places to live in this province. And this government should be ashamed for that, that response. 32 per cent less housing starts last year in this province. That's your record. And it's Order. not just Toronto, Speaker. Order. Essex, government side, come to, order. to Milton, to Canada, to Timmins, we now have a homelessness crisis in every corner of this province. The Association of Municipalities of Ontario points to this Conservative government's terrible policy and chronic underinvestment. Speaker, why is the government sitting on $6.4 billion dollars while people are falling into desperation without safe and stable homes to live in? Housing. Speaker, there are two people that I want to talk about right now. Two tremendous, to steal a phrase from the Premier, two true champions for municipal support and for support for housing. And that's Premier Doug Ford, who, who led the way with the federal negotiations and provided $4 billion to support our municipalities. And the other speaker is our finance minister, the Honourable Peter Bethlehem Paul. Oh. Taken uh, our message to the deputy prime minister in those negotiations Order. around funding. You know, I'm proud to be with a government that continues to stand up for municipalities during the pandemic. That continues to increase 
the, the uh, housing uh, prevention program that New Democrats voted against, they the social it. services relief fund Response. increase that New Democrats voted against. It's pretty rich coming from the Leader of the Opposition when she says one thing, but then when it's time to vote, we all know what's going to happen. You Democrats always vote no, every single time. The final supplementary. Speaker, this government can give each other as many gold stars as they like, but I would like to ask them to listen to the people in the galleries today who are representing the folks that are experiencing this right now. We know, they know, that this Conservative government is failing Ontarians when it comes to affordable housing. Their inaction on homelessness isn't just a moral crisis, it is an economic failure. It is costing every one of us more in emergency room visits, in shelter services, in lost economic participation. Speaker, this government has Order. abandoned its goal of ending chronic homelessness by 2025. So my question to the Premier is, will he recommit to this goal and invest the funds required to get it done? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. The people who are committed to uh, getting it done are the Ontario PC Party. New Democrats yeah. continue. Let's, let's remember, we, when we increased Order. the homeless prevention program, Order. they did not support that. New Democrats did not support that. Yeah. When we created uh, the My Name List, which the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness recognizes is fundamental. Uh, to being able to identify and to be able to deal with the homelessness problem in our country. They did not support that. New Democrats said no. We continue to provide uh, the necessary dollars. You know, I I've said this in the House, and, and Minister Smith was the, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, when we made that first Order. social services relief fund announcement right here in the legislature, you know, three days after the pandemic was called. Those dollars in, in the, our most vulnerable help food banks, help, help PPE, made sure that our most vulnerable in the middle of that pandemic uh, you know, were supported. We're going to continue to work with our partners, but we need the federal government, and we, and we need New Democrats to support us when we ask for the money that they owe. Next question, the member from University of Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, the City of Toronto's long-awaited housing plan came out. And in that report, it said that the housing plan is at high risk because of this government's controversial Bill 23. <laughs> Toronto is now on track to lose $1.2 billion in development fee revenue earmarked just for shelter space and affordable housing. And they're losing that revenue at a time when Toronto's housing affordability and homelessness crisis is getting worse. Minister, what exactly is your plan? to help Toronto solve the housing affordability and homelessness crisis. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, the NDP speaker are a party that supports taxing affordable housing. They're a party that supports taxing uh, non-profit housing. Why would you want to do we'll that? You know, the, the, the narrative that that member continues uh, to put forward is not correct, Speaker. You know, the, the municipalities will still be able to charge development charges. That, that, that's a given. But, but again, what we're talking about is affordable housing, non-profit housing. I spent uh, last week touring developments that would ultimately save hundreds of thousands of dollars to create uh, more housing opportunities for our most vulnerable. This is the type of housing that we want to incent, and that's why we're providing that development charge relief. So for the member to say what she Response. just said in the House, I invite her to say it outside. Oh. <laughs> Supplementary question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Speaker, Mr. Pranesh Das, a single parent who has been living in a basement apartment for a decade with his adult son and teenage daughter has been waiting since 2014 to get a response on their RGI application with TCHC. Speaker, his children grew up, started high school, university, his wife passed away, all while being stuck on a wait list and being underhoused. This family is losing hope. And I really hope that the minister won't give me his talking points or how he's gonna rip apart the green belt. So my question is, Speaker, with the budget date coming up, 
Will this government financially commit to increase the stock of deeply affordable housing and social housing for all Ontarians, like Mr. Panesh? Thank you very much. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I guess I could ask the member opposite the same question. When, when we uh, have increased dollars in the past, you didn't support that. You know, uh, you know. So, so we'll take your we'll take your your question at its face value. We'll reach out to Toronto Community Housing, who has all the operational decision making uh, for your constituent. But the fact of the matter is this: the NDP support taxing affordable housing. They support increased taxes for affordable housing. They support increased tax, you know, on nonprofit housing. We need to build more nonprofit housing yes. for Toronto community housing. We need all 47 service managers and our two Indigenous program administrators to work with us to get shovels in the ground faster. They're committed to doing that. But again, Speaker, there's one partner that's on the sidelines, Bunce. and that's the NDP. Okay. The members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. For years, hundreds of thousands of auto and manufacturing jobs were chased out of our province by the previous Liberal government, leaving Ontario unprepared for the electric vehicle revolution. Simply put, Speaker, Ontario was in no position to build the cars of the future. That's why our government must take aggressive action to rebuild our province's auto sector and attract investment all while growing the economy and creating good, paying jobs. Last week, we were thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to hear the historic investment and announcement from Volkswagen in my riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London. <laughs> Speaker, can the minister please provide more information about this game-changing, in fact, generational-changing investment Question. and what it means for this province? <laughs> minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. First speaker, thank you to the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London for his important role in bringing Volkswagen to his riding of St. Thomas. Rob, you did spectacular work. Last week, we landed an historic investment from Europe's largest automaker. This is Volkswagen's first overseas EV battery manufacturing plant right here in Ontario. Speaker, they had sites all over the globe to choose from, but they selected Ontario because they saw that we are transforming Ontario's automotive supply chain to build the cars of the future. They saw that we lowered the cost of doing business in Ontario by $7 billion Spons. annually, and that brought $17 billion in auto investment. They saw that we're building an EV auto sector, and they want it to be an important part of that. This legislature says, welcome, Volkswagen. <laughs> Members will please take their seats. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's truly spectacular to see the commitment and hard work of our government pay off in the form of attracting significant investment to this province. And thank you to the leadership of the Premier and this Minister, who I know worked diligently and hard and got this job done as a competitive jurisdiction. We are now um, ready and easier to do business and invest and build, not only in Elgin, Middlesex, London, but throughout the province. Securing a major deal, such as Volkswagen's decision to pick Ontario, as he says, over 40 sites in, in, on, on, in North America that we competed against um, for this electrical battery plant, didn't happen by accident. Clearly, much planning, effort, and cooperation took place in advance to get to this point. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on what steps were taken to promote Ontario as a favourable de destination for Volkswagen and how he got the job done? Minister of Economic Development, Creed. This game-changing investment from Volkswagen has been almost a year in the making. Dozens of meetings beginning last, up table, uh, last April, a sales mission to Volkswagen in Germany in October, countless face-to-face -face meetings between our teams, many of them weekend-long marathons, and four meetings with Premier Ford. And as we all know, there is no better deal closer in Ontario than Premier Doug Ford. <laughs> 
All of this amounted to one of the biggest investments in the province's history. From our talented workforce, our clean energy, Ontario's comprehensive EV ecosystem, our abundance of critical minerals, our message has been clear. Ontario has everything companies need to succeed. Speaker, this investment is a major vote of confidence in Ontario's Once. position as the global EV supplier to the world. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My constituent, Sarah, has been forced into homelessness with her six-week-old infant. Sarah is trying desperately to find a space in a shelter, any space. She's been calling shelters consistently for weeks and still cannot get placed, not even with a newborn. Sarah is here at Queen's Park today to watch this debate. She wants the Premier to know that she will lose her child if she does not have access to safe shelter and housing for baby Mia. Premier, where will Sarah and her baby, baby Mia, be sleeping tonight? Will his budget deliver the money for shelters and real affordable housing? Where will she go? When can she get a permanent home? Can she get one by the end of this week? Uh, thank you very much for, for the question, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I uh, uh, would certainly be happy uh, to, uh, to meet with uh, the member's uh, constituent. But it is for, for Sarah and, and for others across the province that we are working so hard to ensure that we can bring jobs and opportunity to the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It is why the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has been working so hard to bring more housing to Ontario. That includes affordable housing, Speaker. That includes affordable housing. And if you look across the government, what the Minister of, uh, of Education did to ensure that we had the best child care deal in the country, Mr. Speaker, in the country, because we want Sarah and we want people in communities across this province to not only have hope today, but hope for tomorrow so that they can have a job, they can have opportunity, that they can live in a safe uh, uh, province of Ontario, one that is booming, Mr. Speaker. So look, that is exactly what we're doing, whether it's the broadband infrastructure investments we're making, the investments that we're making in, in housing across the province of Ontario, and why we are working so hard with our partners at municipal, in the municipal government to ensure that especially purpose-based rentals and non for profits get built. Thank you. The next question, or rather, the supplementary question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. To the minister, five years of Conservative government uh, housing insecurity and homelessness has increased. Food insecurity and food bank use has skyrocketed. Meanwhile, the minister just stood over there and sang the praises of his government. I don't think that's something you should be proud of. My question is to the Premier. In the first quarter of 2023, 51 families in my riding were supported by the Welcome Centre Shelter for Women. Of the 166 total family members, 61 per cent of them were children or youth. Executive Director Lady Lafferette says the biggest predictor of our future homeless population is the children accessing shelters today. Shelters continue to hear announcements of record funding increases to supports for children and youth who have experienced violence that are entering the shelter system, but the front lines aren't seeing it. In the 20 years that Lady has worked in the system, she hasn't seen a single cost of living increase to the Homelessness Prevention Program. Question. My question is this. When will the Premier and his Conservative government stop the photo ops and empty funding announcements, actually do something to end the cycle of homelessness, and provide these families with the supports they need? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I just want to uh, take this opportunity to correct the member. Um, th this government, when it consolidated its three homelessness programs into the homelessness prevention program, we not only took those dollars, but we added an additional $25 million, which uh, was distributed uh, to our, um, our 47 service managers. We also made a significant investment. Uh, to our Indigenous program administrators by adding additional right. uh, supportive housing in the Indigenous supportive housing program. <laughs> so what the member is, is talking about simply is not true. The dollars show that this government continues to increase spending. I'm going to caution the member on his language. The next question. The member for Elgin Middlesex London. Mr. Speaker, my second question, once again, is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. As we know, the investment from Volkswagen represents a truly significant deal by attracting a new major global automotive manufacturer to our province. By landing this highly competitive, and we've talked about that, highly competitive, sought-after investment required support from many offices 
and many teams. Speaker, will the minister please elaborate on how broader government efforts contributed to last week's announcement? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Securing this game-changing Volkswagen investment was an all-of-government effort. Thank you to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for getting the land under one jurisdiction, Ministry of Infrastructure for the Land Assembly, Ministry of Finance, Treasury Board for providing the resources to make this deal happen, Ministry of Energy making sure we have the clean and adequate energy to run this plant. Ministry of Indigenous Affairs for their valuable role in our duty to consent to consult. Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Natural Resources, both making certain that all permits are defined and progressing. Many more speakers will come in the supplementary, but it's obvious. This was a whole of government team working together to make this deal happen. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his question, for his answer. It's great to hear that this was truly a team effort and resulted in Ontario sec securing this historic investment. I also want to thank our municipal partners who stepped up and showed tremendous leadership as part of this process securing a major investment from Volkswagen. Whether it was St. Thomas, Central Elgin, all of Elgin County, or in fact the City of London, they all did a wonderful job in supporting the efforts. Unfortunately, in previous years, my riding and others in southwestern Ontario were associated with job losses in manufacturing. This investment sends a strong signal that our community and all of southwest Ontario is back in business. Without a doubt, many members of this government helped to bring this, this good news last week to fruition. Speaker, will the minister continue to elaborate on the efforts and successes we had in the last week? Of economic development. Speaker, as mentioned, it is an all-of-government effort. Thanks to the Ministry of Transportation providing plans to access this exciting new development. The Ministry of Labour and the Ministry of Colleges and Universities for their plan to train the people who will work at this new plant. Ministry of Mines to promote our critical minerals. Ministry of the Solicitor General as our bid needed a plan for fire and safety for this expansion. Ministry of Education for their child care plans. Ministry of the Attorney General for their work in crafting our agreements. Thank you to every ministry here, Red Tape, Service Ontario, Agriculture, Women's Economic Opportunity, Children's Services, Health, Mental Health, Long-Term Care, Citizenship, Seniors, Tourism, Speaker, every single minister was consulted and contributed Response. at the Cabinet table and made this historic deal happen. Thank you. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 600,000 people accessed Feed Ontario food banks last year. Two-thirds of the people who access food banks are on Ontario Disability Support or Ontario Works. The government has left food banks to deal with our homelessness and hunger crises because they have refused to double ODSP and OW. Will this government do what is right and double ODSP and Ontario Works to ensure that food banks are not left to deal with the homelessness and hunger crises in this province? Of children, community, and social services. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is working across ministries to create the supports and implement the supports that people need when they're at their most vulnerable. And that's exactly why during COVID we invested $1 billion in the social services relief funding. It's, it's why we also are inve have invest been investing $83 million through the Ontario Trillium Foundation to provide grants to help eligible nonprofit organizations, including food banks, recover and continue to deliver vital programs. As part of Ontario's effort to support children, youth and families, we've also provided millions of dollars in funding to Feed Ontario. That funding assisted Feed Ontario in producing and distributing pre-packaged hampers and supporting the great work that food banks do uh, across the province. The Student Nutrition Program, another example of another Fonts. ministry supporting uh, the, the exact needs that the member opposite describes. So we will continue to do this important work. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the reliance on food banks continues to grow under this government, and that's something that you should be ashamed of. 
Deborah, who is in the House today, was cut off of ODSP support when she turned 65. Now her rent, which is geared to income, has increased, and she's lost most of her health benefits. This has left her in an even more precarious situation than when she was on ODSP. She has no option but to go to a food bank for support. Feed Ontario has become increasingly concerned that this government will consider federal CPP benefits as a subsidy to ODSP. Will this government commit to doubling ODSP and Ontario Works and not cutting off people like Deborah when they turn 65? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the truth is that our government is providing more for social assistance than any government in the history of this province. We have, Order. We have increased ODSP in, a, uh, in an amount that has not been done for decades. Order. We have increased the earnings exemption threshold by 400 per cent to allow more people to be able to work and retain more of the dollars that they need to live in dignity. Order. We have been working with the Ministry of Labour, you Immigration, you Training and Skills Member continue. I'm going to ask the member for Spadina Fort York to withdraw. I'll withdraw. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services has a few more seconds. To Thank you, Speaker. And we have been working across ministries to make sure that we develop the programs that are necessary to support people. ODSP is one program. As you've heard, the food bank programs Response. that are there as well. This is something that is taken in combination with other programs that are available. And I'm very proud to say that our government. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. The Globe and Mail recently published a report about gas wells in Ontario, the first petroleum-producing province. While today there is a responsible natural gas industry, there is a problem with legacy dormant wells, and southwestern Ontario is ground central. In Norfolk County alone, there are 2,634 dormant wells, one of which has been in the news for years. The county lacks the expertise to remedy or monitor the situation. Speaker, one more problem well could financially destroy the municipality. We know in Wheatley the issue was acute with an explosion, and experts predict it's just a matter of time until another explosion occurs. Southwestern Ontario is literally a powder keg ready to blow. Where will it be? Chatham, Kent, Lambton, Elgin, Norfolk. Speaker, to the ministry, to the minister, what is the ministry's plan to address legacy wells in Ontario? To reply, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to ensure this House that we are doing everything we can to protect the safety of Ontario's people, population, and communities, especially in Southwest Ontario. And you know, I had a, uh, a meeting with Mayor Martin from Norfolk at the, the Roma Conference in January, and she came to say thank you. Thank you for the investment that this government has made uh, in a well that was problematic in their community. And the conversation uh, went on, and we had a great talk about what we can do. And we are continuing to work on legacy oil and gas wells and continuing to have conversations to invoke a strategy that will make a meaningful difference. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, absent is federal dollars that have gone to other jurisdictions. And in 2020 and in 2022, uh, my office wrote the federal government and asked that Ontario be uh, made a Spons. partner and available uh, to these have these dollars available to us and we uh, continue to wait for a response to that uh, to help with our plans here in Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. I want to be clear and I want to differentiate between abandoned wells and private gas wells rural land users, landowners use as their source of power. The latter group are not a problem, but yet they received a letter stating there will be no extension to any licensed well after September 2032. Speaker, I hope the ministry can find a more positive way forward for my farmers and farm families, especially in Haldeman County, who rely on these wells. But at the same time, the ministry must take action on legacy wells. A recent McGill University study looked at abandoned wells, testing levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. The study concluded the methane levels were underestimated. Methane is a greenhouse gas and hydrogen sulfide can be toxic. This problem is bigger than the province of Ontario, and I'm heartened to hear, Speaker, that the minister Question. is putting pressure on the federal government. I'm asking what additional pressure the ministry will put on the federal government to ward off a pending environmental and catastrophic disaster. 
Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you uh, again for the question from the member opposite. Uh, again, we will continue to ask the federal government for support, but as we go through this process, I think it's important to also know that uh, we will be in communities in southwest Ontario this spring, important listening sessions to hear from communities, to hear from people that are directly affected by this problem. Again, we are taking this very, very seriously and developing a strategy that will benefit Ontarians, especially those in southwest Ontario, uh, in the future. Future. And I think it's really uh, also uh, important to note that uh, you know for the folks in Wheatley that have been through uh, a devastating uh, and difficult time, this government has been there every step of the way. Premier Ford was there for them every step of the way. And my visit in October uh, to be able to speak with homeowners, business owners, and officials, Spons. you know, we said we would use this as a learning experience. We mean that, and we are going to implement that in a solution going forward. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It was my pleasure to welcome the minister uh, to my riding last week as we visited the United Mennonite Homes in Vineland. Walter Squazen and the team at United Mennonite Homes uh, offer exceptional care, long-term care, supportive housing, and independent living for seniors in my community. And we reviewed their plans to expand and offer more supportive and affordable housing for seniors in Niagara. Now, I know our government's recent updates to development charges will open new opportunities for organizations like the United Mennonite Home, and I'm wondering if the minister could speak a little bit about how these changes will make it easier for not-for-profits uh, to build affordable housing and deliver critical services to vulnerable Ontarians, such as those uh, in my riding who are looking forward to these investments continuing to being made. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I, I want to thank uh, the member for Niagara West uh, for the great tour that we had uh, in his riding last week. You know, Speaker, you sure know uh, what a great job the member's doing when you spend some time in their riding meeting with uh, their constituents. You know, Speaker, I've said it many times this morning, actually, in the House. Uh, our government does not believe that nonprofit and affordable housing providers should be charged huge unsustainable fees when looking to build affordable housing for vulnerable Ontarians. That's why through More Homes Built Faster, Bill 23, our government is eliminating development charges for affordable, non-profit and select attainable housing. I'm hearing from housing providers from all corners of the province about the immediate and the positive impact that these changes are having Spons. with affordable and non-profit housing providers now being able to reinvest these savings into their projects uh, and create more opportunities for their residents. I'll have more to say in the supplemental speaker. The supplementary question. Very much, Speaker. For too long, governments did nothing, leading to a crisis in affordable housing in the province of Ontario. But our government took to decisive action under the leadership of this minister and Premier Ford to deliver on a mandate to build 1.5 million homes here in the province of Ontario. And we know that from the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force, we've seen some municipalities raise development charges by some 900 per cent over the last 20 years, a completely ridiculous number. Our governments must urgently respond to the recommendations and implement measures which will address the housing supply crisis and get more homes built faster. And at a time when Ontarians are struggling with rising costs of living, we know that the fees that are put onto these builds, especially not-for-profits and affordable housing, only push the dream of home ownership further out of reach for so many and harm some of the most vulnerable, including our seniors. So, Speaker, could the minister please elaborate to the Jim. House what our government is doing to incentivize more affordable housing here in the province of Ontario and in my record? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I'm proud of the changes our government's made, and I'm thrilled to see that uh, shovels are getting in the ground. The project that, uh, that we toured was a tremendous campus of care that United Mennonite Homes were working on, and in fact, the savings that they would receive because of Bill 23 was $1.6 million, Speaker. Very, very significant dollars to help that project come shovel ready. Uh, earlier that week, I uh, toured with the member for Whitby. And, and toured uh, Habitat for Humanity build along with Durham Region Nonprofit Housing Corporation. Their new affordable housing that they hope uh, they'll open later this year. Their savings was over $500,000 wow. on that affordable housing project. That's Our government's committed right to lower the cost of housing to get shovels in the ground faster and Spons. to support some of the great nonprofits like Habitat and, and like United Mennonite Homes. So here, here. thanks for the here, question. Here. 
Thank you. The next question, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you. Question for the Premier. In the pre-budget consultation, uh, my colleague in Temis Kamin Cochrane asked to the President of the uh, Assembly of Francophony an, an assessment of the health ser services uh, since the reform and how the initiatives of the Ministry of Health can be uh, translated for Francophones. And the answer was that they didn't know because there were no performance indicators. So my question to the minister is, can you please tell us what are the results for health services in French and what are the basis of your response? Thank you. And to respond. You know, it, uh, it is really important that when we look at the expansions that we are doing uh, with Bill 60, that we also understand where the needs and the areas of expansion have to happen. And of course, uh, one of those uh, processes for assessment will be how we can better serve the Francophone community in the province of Ontario. That is why I am so excited about Bill 60, because we now have a formalized process that ensures where the needs are in community, close to community, will be part of the application approval process. And it will ensure, to the member's point, that when we are looking for areas that have traditionally not been served as well and perhaps have longer wait lists, we now have a process through Bill 60 if passed to ensure that we can expand Spons. those surgical community and uh, diagnostic areas. Thank you. And the supplementary question. I heard the answer from the minister, but this is only words and words. The problem is still pursuant. There are always the same problems. My constituents are coming to me with preoccupations when it comes to francophone services. So once again, I reiterate my question. What is the ministry doing to collect all this data and answer all the preoccupations of the francophones. Merci, le député de l'opposition, pour sa question. Uh, notre gouvernement uh, prend très au sérieux la, les services en français, uh, en santé, en, éduca en éducation, uh, à travers uh, les services du gouvernement. Monsieur le Président, uh, nous avons modernisé pour la première. For the first time ever, we modernize the French Language Services Act since it has been passed. Mr. Speaker, the opposition voted for the modernization of this act. It was actually deceiving because it was a basic act for francophones living in Ontario. I am working closely with my colleague, the Minister of Health, and I was also honored to hear recommendations when it comes to modernizing the Act when it comes to French language services. We will continue working closely with the community and with the Minister of Health. First Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education, uh, and I also want to personally thank him for his advice and friendship as our time working together. Uh, Ontario's population is growing rapidly, Speaker, and our government's ensuring that we're building houses, but we also must ensure that we're providing the next generation of Ontario students with the skills they need to succeed. For over a decade and a half, under the previous Liberal government, neglected to prepare stu our students for the jobs of tomorrow and, that and the absolutely require to build and sustain Ontario. In the construction sector alone, we know we will need 70,000 workers by 2027 to meet our province's growing infrastructure needs. New knowledge and skills must be taught to our students so that they will be successfully prepared to fill the Question. jobs that are so desperately needed. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is equipping our students for a lifelong careers that will build Ontario for generations to come? Minister of Education. Allow me to take a moment to thank the member from Perth Wellington for his exceptional leadership in the ministry and in this province. He has 
move the yardstick forward on a major file of modernizing our curriculum because we want our young people to learn the life and job skills that have been missing in the curriculum under the former Liberals for a decade of inaction. While the economy changed around the world, Ontario's students were learning a stagnant curriculum, disconnected from the job skills necessary. Because of our government and our leadership, we are now ensuring modern curriculum in math, in science, in computer sciences, in technology. Right across the STEM curriculums, everything has been modernized with an emphasis on mandatory learning, on financial literacy, and on life skills. Things like learning about taxation and about credit and debt, about learning how to save for a home. Response. These are real skills that are necessary. They're now infused in addition to hiring the best educator based on their merit. Together, we're giving these kids our best fight of success. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It's certainly encouraging to hear about the leadership our government is demonstrating by encouraging skilled trades careers for our young people, along with investments to deliver on that commitment. However, these efforts will not pay dividends if our students are not connected with the skills or opportunities they need to pursue a career in the skilled trades field. Given the reality that one in five jobs by 2026 will be in the skilled trades, it will take an all-hands-deck approach to meet the need in our society. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to ensure that our students are exposed to the opportunities that are available to the skilled trades and other technology fields? Great question. Mr. Education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a critical question, and of course, we know there's hundreds of thousands of skilled labour shortages today in our economy. And because of the leadership of the Minister of Economic Development, the Premier, we have more investments, including Volkswagen, a historic investment in Ontario, and a sign of confidence in our future, Mr. Speaker, to ensure those companies can fill their workplaces with skilled labour. We're ensuring, for the first time, starting in September of 2024, every student in grade nine or ten will now be required to take a technological education course. Course, opening up their horizons and their opportunities to these good-paying jobs and meaningful careers where they exist. Mr. Speaker, there are a wide variety of options for young people, and most especially, as the Minister of Social and Economic uh, Opportunities for Women had said just weeks ago, this is going to create a greater pathway for more women to enter the trades Response. enter tech, and get the best-paying jobs in this economy. Speaker. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. If you are a resident of a private for profit long term care home in Ontario during the pandemic, you are nearly twice as likely to die from COVID 19 than in non for profit home. But this government is helping for profit long term care to expand even after 5,400 people died. Extended Care announced an agreement to buy Rivera's shares in 18 homes and manage the remaining 31, pending the approval of this government. So my question is simple to the minister. Why would this government allow one of the worst actors in long-term care to get more control of and make more profits from this sector? Thank you. The Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by that question because uh, the minister or the member opposite has voted against every single initiative that we put in place to improve long-term care across Order. the province of Ontario. Now, Order. just Friday, just Friday, colleagues, I was at the Rakai Centre in Toronto, a, a wonderful not-for-profit, announcing an additional $1.2 billion to increase the level of care to three hours and 42 minutes across the province of Ontario. Ironically, that member and that party voted against no. that investment, Mr. Speaker. Now, we also brought in, through the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, the toughest, the toughest regulations across the province, across this country, Mr. Speaker. We've also doubled the amount of inspectors to have the highest inspector-to-home ratio, not just in Canada, but in North America, Mr. Speaker. And all the time, that member and that party voted against it, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you very much. This government can ramble about their investments, but doesn't answer the question. Private for profit homes. Why don't you guys listen? Private for profit homes had, and I want this to listen here, 78% more COVID deaths than non profit homes. Those are our parents, 
our grandparents, our moms, our dads, our brothers and sisters. Extended care has one of the highest death rates during the pandemic, and now they will own one in every five homes in Ontario. Wow. What will it take for this Conservative government to start caring for the well-being of people in long-term care homes above corporate profits and friends and donors and protect and stop the dying in long-term care homes? 55,400 died, most in profit homes. Thank you. To respond. Again, 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 long -term Mr. Care. Speaker, uh, what, let's, let's look at what the opposition want us to do. They want us to nationalize long-term care. They want us to spend billions of dollars buying real estate, Mr. Speaker. Instead, what we're going to do is put the Order. toughest regulations in North America, which we've done, back that up by the highest inspector to home ratio in North America, which we've done, increase the level of care to four hours, which we are doing this year, an additional $1.2 billion, next year, an additional $1.8 billion, which we're doing. We're going to hire 27,000 additional health care workers for long-term care alone, and we're making sure that we're getting the homes built because the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is giving me MZO so that I can get those homes built. Yeah. The Minister of Colleges and Universities is, is training PSWs and nurses to ensure that we can get it done. The Minister of Labour, of course, is training the people who are building these homes across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're Spons? building homes, we're staffing them, we're giving them the highest level of care, something that they have voted Order. against every, every time. single yep. time. Every Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Today is the International Day of the Francophonie. March is actually the month of Francophonie. Francophones in Ontario are important when it comes to our economic prosperity. I am proud to be Francophone. I am proud to serve the Francophones in my writing. Our government should support businesses and agencies who offer services in French and helps French people in Canada, in Ontario rather. Many factors had impacted our economic measures. Can the minister tell us how the government will support Francophones in my riding and in the rest of Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for his excellent question. PAFO is a program for our ministry. Our government invested $2 billion each year. This program will help Ontarian francophones by helping financial means for projects in order for them to reinforce the ability of businesses to provide French services. This program will help hiring French people and create occasions to celebrate Francophony in Ontario. During this month of Francophony, I am proud to launch the 2023-2024 edition of the program. Our government will continue issue using measures for Francophony. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the minister for her answer. It is a pleasure to hear that this uh, program will have a new edition this year. This will help many businesses, and this is essential for our province. Thanks to those initiatives, our government will offer a high quality of life for all our Ontarians, and will make sure we are participating in the social and cultural activity of the province. Can the minister tell us how important the International Day of the Francophonie is, and can she tell us how our government is recognizes the special needs of the Francophones in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, the International Day of Francophonie is the occasion for us to recognize the contributions of Francophone Ontarians that who have been living in Canada for more than 400 years. We are also recognizing diversity of Franco-Ontarians. Every year, we are welcoming newcomers. Our government recognizes 
how Francophonie is an asset for the province. We are committed to support businesses and Francophone organizations so they can continue contributing to the social well-being of our province. PAFO and other programs delivered in French through our Quebec-Ontario agreements are part of our strategy for Francophonie. We want to support Francophone, Francophone business in Ontario and the community in Ontario. In many communities in Thunder Bay Superior North, it is impossible to recruit educators and healthcare workers because there's nowhere to house them. We can even offer to pay them $150,000, but they still might not be able to find a place to live. With new mines coming, if there's no new housing built within existing communities, workers will be stuck living in camps, leading to increased isolation, high rates of addiction, and risks to neighbouring communities. Will the government provide direct funding to support the building of housing in northwestern Ontario that also takes into account the higher costs of building in smaller northern communities? Associate Minister of Housing. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the very important question. And She's absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. We are working very hard to make sure that there's more homes available across the entire province, Mr. Speaker, which is why, if you look at our record the last couple of years, we had a number of housing starts, Mr. Speaker, since we haven't had since 1987. And we're not going to stop there, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to go forward. Why? Because of the jobs that we're creating for the people of this province, we don't want to be second to any jurisdiction. We have the best and brightest living right here in this province. We think we're number one in everything. We'll make sure we have the house, houses for the jobs that are coming to this province, thanks to the help of this minister and our premier, Mr. Speaker. So I'll rest assured, we'll make sure that we'll even break the records of previous years. We'll get to our 1.5 million homes so we don't let your constituents down. And the supplementary, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A recent CMHC rental report found that new rental supply is not translating to lower rents. In fact, households on Russell Avenue in St. Catharines are being gouged with a 17 per cent rent increase. Whoa. This is because this Conservative government has cut rent control on new builds. These are young families. These are professionals with good incomes. Question to the Premier. Can you explain why your housing plan is leading to a transfer of profits from young families in Niagara to outside developers? And will you take these double-digit rent increases seriously by implementing real rent control today to put families first? Right on. The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thanks for the question. The young family that the member is, uh, is referring to, Mr. Speaker, is exactly who what this government is fighting for, to make sure that they are not priced out of the housing market. Mr. Speaker, because of our government, the rent decrease guideline is capped at 2.5%. If it weren't because of inflation, it would be at 5.3% or higher. Now, Mr. Speaker, we've said it time and again. We need more supply. We're in a housing supply crisis in this province, but we're the only ones that are fighting for the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. We're the only ones that are saying that we need to make sure we bring the housing prices down so that people can afford it. But Order. the opposition continuously opposes us. They'll talk about housing, Mr. Speaker, Order. but they'll vote against it. They'll talk about protection for tenants. We put Opposition in a bill. They'll vote against the uh, the housing, uh, the protection for tenants, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Two Response. record years. L in last year, we broke the record in the province's history for the number of purpose-built rental units. Stop the clock. The next question, start the clock, member for Eglinton-Lawrence. My question is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. 
Seniors in Ontario want the ability to be active and socially connected in their communities. Our government must support investments that address social isolation and help older adults live healthy lifestyles. I was pleased to see the minister recently visit North York to announce funding as part of the Seniors Community Grants Program. Our local community is appreciative of the work by the Premier and this minister in providing support for programs and educational activities for seniors. Speaker, can the minister please explain why this funding is important for the constituents of North York and for seniors across Ontario? Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you to the member from Eglis Lawrence for this important question. The members of Toronto West are doing a marvelous job to make sure seniors are getting the funding they deserve. Social isolation is enemy number one. We must keep seniors connected, active to fight social isolation. That is why our government has invested over $22 million into over 1,200 senior projects across Ontario. This is one of the many ways we are working for you to build better Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Seniors in our province face additional barriers in accessing services that can prevent social isolation. As Ontario's population continues to age, our government must continue to provide seniors with high-quality supports. Empowering our seniors in their own communities will contribute to overall improved health and social well-being. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how seniors' community grants programs benefit our seniors in our province? Mr. Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you again for another important question. The MPPs for Eglinton Lawrence, Etobicoke Centre, Etobicoke Lakeshore, Etobicoke Nose, Willowdale, York Centre, York Southwestern are showing passion and leadership when it comes to improving the lives of seniors in Ontario. Since 2018, Toronto West has received almost $2 million for senior community grants to stop social isolation and fight ageism. These grants support educational activities, improve mental health, and support low-income seniors live a better life in their communities. This program is one of the ways we are working for you Response. to serve the needs of Ontarians. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.